I'm David Courtright, and it's my privilege to welcome you to today's event, uh, which is sponsored by the Keough School of Global Affairs and the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame, and co-sponsored by Veterans for Peace and the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Uh, we gather today to commemorate an event that took place 50 years ago when Vietnam veterans came to Washington to protest the Vietnam War, an operation that we called Dewey Canyon Three. That name comes from previous failed US military operations in Vietnam, then in 69 and 71, incursions into Laos that so well epitomize the deception, the futility and the bloody horror of that war. Uh, so the name was brought for this event. 1,200 Vietnam veterans or more came to Washington uh, for this so-called limited incursion into the land of Congress. Uh, the Nixon administration had real trouble dealing with the veterans uh, because they have so much authenticity and credentials and social standing as those who had actually fought in the war had more credibility to speak on this war than anyone. Uh, the president tried to claim that only about 30% of those gathered were veterans. Uh, and because of good preparation, the VVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War sponsors, gathered together the uh, discharge papers of all the veterans that have been asked to bring them. So there were 1,200 uh, DD-214 discharge papers presented to the press to show that we're legit, uh, the vets were here. Uh, the administration filed an injunction against the veterans and ban prohibited them from camping. They did anyway. It was a high drama with the courts, uh, but the vets basically defied a Supreme Court order. Uh, and even the police, the Capitol Police, were unwilling to arrest them. And essentially, the veterans defied that order and won. And there was a, a local newspaper that had a, a headline that said, Vets Overrule Supreme Court. And this event gathered tremendous amount of press coverage. It was uh, on, in the evening news broadcasts, uh, sometimes the lead story. Uh, when John Kerry gave his famous testimony that we'll see a few minutes of here, uh, it was covered live on television and then in the evening news. Uh, the White House was in a panic. Uh, John Dean, the White House counsel, was sending the president regular updates every hour about what the vets were doing, what the press coverage was. Uh, and there's a famous quote from H.R. Haldeman, uh, who came out of one of these meetings and put into his memoirs. He said, uh, the veterans are killing us, as he put it. Uh, the networks are running the veterans show every evening in great detail, and we have no way to fight back. They're, we're getting chopped up by the vets. Um, so it's an important action for a lot of reasons, and we'll talk about that here in this program. And we also want to talk about the significance of these events for the military today, for soldiers and veterans. And we have a couple of our post 9-11 veterans from Vets for Peace who will be speaking. So let me introduce the panel. It's a tremendous group. Um, first will be Jan Berry. Jan is a poet, journalist, educator, veteran of the Vietnam War, author of more than a dozen books of poetry, prose and photography. And he was one of the founders of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Next will be Lamont Steptoe, a poet, photographer, publisher who served in Vietnam in 1968 and 69, is the author or editor of 15 poetry collections, including Meditations in Congo Square, a recipient of numerous honors and awards, the American Book Award, a Pew Fellowship, and a fellowship from the Pennsylvania Council of Arts. Stephen Talbot is a renowned television producer and investigative journalist, longtime contributor to PBS, produced more than 40 episodes of Frontline, received many awards for broadcast journalism, including two Emmys, uh, three Peabody Awards, and a George Polk Award. And I might add that Steve's working now on a new film, The Movement and the Madman, which examines how the anti-war movement prevented the Nixon administration from carrying out a, a massive escalation of the war, including possible use of nuclear weapons that was planned in the fall of 69. We have Chuck Searcy, who was stationed in Vietnam in 1967 and 68, who returned home to Georgia to help found a local VVAW chapter. He later returned to Vietnam and in 2001 helped launch Project Renew, 
in Guangfei province, which has been working since then to clean up unexploded ordnance, uh, to provide health care and rehabilitation support for the many Vietnamese victims of uh, UXO explosions and Agent Orange ex exposure. In 2004, Circe was awarded the National Friendship Medal by the Vietnamese government, the highest honor available to a non-Vietnamese citizen. Also with us is Carlotta Scott, who worked in the House of Representatives for more than 20 years as the Chief of Staff for California Representative Ron Dellums, who played a key role as a veteran himself in Congress, uh, and we'll hear more about that. And also she worked for Barbara Lee uh, and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Carlotta is a political organizer, trainer, advocate, strategist, who's been an advisor for dozens of organizations over the years, including Peace Action, where I was the director years before, uh, where she served as a board member for many years. Uh, Lauren Model received her PhD at the University of Leeds in 2018 and wrote her dissertation on the patriotism of protest, writing about the citizen soldier ideal during the Vietnam War. She del delivered a paper at the Voices of Conscience Conference here at the University of Notre Dame in 2018. And she serves as an assistant editor of the Journal of American Studies and writes for US Studies Online. Also with us is Adrian Kinney, who served in the Army and the Army Reserves from 1994 to 2004 as an Arab linguist in military intelligence. She was activated after 9-11 and served stateside in support of the military operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. She was a regional leader of Iraq Veterans Against the War and is currently the president of the Veterans for Peace Board of Directors. And lastly will be Garrett Reppenhagen, who enlisted in the Army in 01, was deployed to Iraq as a sniper in 2004, was one of the first public opponents of the war, and was an early member of Iraq Veterans Against the War later serving as the chair of the board of directors. And currently he is the executive director of Veterans for Peace. So leading us off is Jan Barry. Hi, um, David, I wanna thank you and all the other people who helped put this event together. Um, <clears throat> I wrote a poem for this event amongst my other contributions to peace activism, uh, I write poetry. Returning war medals to Congress. We now strip ourselves of these medals of courage and heroism, a jungle jacket clad Marine Jack Smith announced on behalf of a battalion sized cluster of Vietnam veterans assembled one morning in front of the US Capitol. We cast these medals away, Smith thundered as symbols of dishonor, shame and inhumanity. One by one, several hundred grim young men stepped forward to toss purple hearts, air medals, silver and bronze stars, campaign ribbons and other medals over a crowd control fence blocking access to the Capitol. Here's my merit badges for murder, shouted a burly vet, ripping rows of combat ribbons off his uniform. I'm not proud of these medals. I'm not proud of what I did to receive them. Another vet yelled into a microphone Many other angry vets recalled lost buddies as they flung war medals in disgust on this day, April 23rd, 1971. Hundreds of fed up vets caravaned to Washington from Ohio, California, New York, New England, Florida, from cities and small towns across the US to conduct Operation Dewey Canyon Three an incursion into the country of Congress. They pressed to testify at congressional hearings about atrocities that spawned nightmares they weren't supposed to talk about and horrible experiences in veterans hospitals. They camped out in the mall for a week despite threats from the Nixon administration to be arrested. They persisted in talking to Congress, Capitol Police, the press, they had a message for their fellow Americans. Listen, you newsmen, we're not giving you the medals. We're turning them into the country. Don't touch them. I'm here because I was in Vietnam. I know what I did and it was wrong. I'd like to say one thing 
for the people of Vietnam, another urgent voice boomed out, I'm sorry. I hope that someday I can return to Vietnam and help rebuild that country we tore apart. I'd also written a version of what I'm gonna say next <clears throat> for the Vietnam veterans of, uh, against the war uh, newspaper that's coming out shortly. When I was asked to write about it, you can see where I was started with, where I wrote details get hazy thinking about 50 years ago. 1971 was a blur of anti-war actions, organizing meetings, writing about what should be done about ending the war in Southeast Asia. All this on top of trying to deal with some nameless condition. Let us call it survivor guilt, moral injury, Agent Orange poisoning, and other things we didn't yet know about with insomnia, terrible nightmares, and panic attacks thrown in. Shortly after my 28th birthday that January, many of us went to Detroit, Michigan for the Winter Soldier investigation. In a provocative approach, EVAW publicly examined war crimes through our own actions and observations as soldiers in Vietnam. Despite our best efforts to show there was a perverse policy of deliberately killing civilians and conducting other atrocities by US forces in Vietnam, vets who spoke out about their experiences were appalled by the scant national news media coverage. A crowd of furious vets jammed into a conference room at Howard Johnson's in Detroit, denouncing the news media and wrangling about what to do next. John Kerry spoke out like a bullhorn and urged us to march on to Washington and take this to Congress. Mike McCusker, a former Marine war correspondent, suggested calling the March on Washington Dewey Canyon Three, a sarcastic reference to an incursion of Laos by South Vietnamese troops as the Winter Soldier investigation got underway. This was curiously called Dewey Canyon Two. Well, amongst the vets who came to Detroit, it was revealed that they had participated in a secret incursion into Laos by a Marine unit. This had never been reported before. Um, so on April 19th, a couple thousand vets marched past the White House and set up camp on the mall in Washington under the banner of Dewey Canyon 3. EVAW activists I'm sorry, Dewey Canyon activists found that the police, much to our surprise, were reluctant to arrest this array of aggrieved war veterans. Indeed, when the US Supreme Court ruled that the VVAW encampment on the mall was illegal, the US Park Police declined to arrest us. Indeed, it took a defiant demonstration on the steps of the Supreme Court demanding a ruling on the constitutionality of the war in Vietnam to provoke the authorities to arrest 110 vets for obstructing and impeding justice. A judge reduced the charges to disorderly conduct and released the arrestees on $10 bonds. Groups of vets lobbied members of Congress in their offices and at committee hearings. Many were rebuffed by their representatives who lectured combat vets about the conduct of the war. Others in Congress were supportive. A transcript of the Winter Soldier investigation testimony was read in the congressional record by Senator Mark Hatfield, Republican of Oregon, and Senator George McGovern, a Democrat of South Dakota, and others called for a congressional investigation of the war crimes charges. These events were among VVAW's best legacies along with the lifetime of friendships forged among men and women who spoke truth to power together back in the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Uh, please, Lamont, step toe, please. Before I read the poems that I'm going to um, 
read, which is just basically one poem, five stanzas. Um, I'd like to show that <clears throat> this is a collection of a, a book put together by a man whose brother was a Vietnam veteran. And it's called Soul Soldiers. And it's about the black experience of the Vietnam veteran. This is another book called Writing Between the Lines, um, published by the University of Massachusetts Press, which are filled with works by Vietnam veterans, not only um, men, but also women, women who were nurses in Vietnam. And this is the uh, book called Radical Vision from the University of Georgia Press, which it critically examines uh, the soldier American poets of the Vietnam War. Of oh, the um, this this um, book here, from both sides now has not only the poetry of American soldier poets, but also um, the spouses of Vietnam veterans and also um, South Vietnamese soldier poets, and also people from the peace movement, and also um, poetry by Ho Chi Minh. I volunteered to go to Vietnam. I was not a, I was not a draftee. Um, there was a military tr tradition in my family. Um, we've served in three wars. Um, and I went to Vietnam as a witness. I consciously went there as a poet and as a witness. And what I'm going to be reading from is my third collection about the Vietnam War called Uncle South China Sea Blue Nightmare. <clears throat> In country autobiographical showers of internal waters rushing to surface, inhalation of humid wind, frozen still in ovens of sun. Disbelief, that is what is beyond the air conditioned doorway is not 3D Hollywood. Mama, wake me up. I wanna leave this dream. Not waking, walk forward into the dream into the bodies shrouded in green uniforms and sweat. Walk forward into the faces 10,000 years old, not yet 20. No turning back. All roads lead home now, even if you can't wake up when you get there. Kids different from kids you ever knew, shout in sounds you never heard. No, they are not smiling. They wear masks of anger. All hands are filled with rocks. Now the stones come flying toward you. How they glisten in the sun from liquid palms. Jerking back from missiles that slam grip metal bus screen screens, you are surprised. Welcome to Uncle South China Sea Blue Nightmare that promises to scare the life right out of you. <clears throat> And the final stanza of that poem. Dap, slap, flippity, flap. Johnny Walker red, Johnny Walker black. Frontline re fever has thinned the ranks. Long been jail is another thanks. Black men are a nation under siege. If you live to fight another day, the white man will try to kill you in the US of A. Um, I got home from uh, Vietnam in December 1970, and um, the only thing I noticed about myself was, why did I feel so tired all the time? 30 years later, I would understand, because I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. I've also had three cancer surgeries. Um, two for bladder cancer and one for prostate cancer due to my exposure to Agent Orange. One of the other side effects of Agent Orange is hypertension. And I also suffer with that. Um, so when I got back, um, I just tried to go back to my regular life. 
you know, which was go back to college um, and forget about Vietnam. But um, when I became a father, um, my daughter, who was three years old, she was the first one to diagnose my PTSD. She said to me one day, Daddy, you have a serious problem. It took me 10 years before I went to the veterans hospital and got diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but the one thing that has saved me, saved me from the streets, saved me from being one of the homeless veterans um, was the fact that I'm a writer, I'm a poet. And like I said, I consciously went to Vietnam to be a witness so that I could write about that war. Thank you, Lamont. Appreciate it very much. My pleasure. Yes. Um, now I'll turn it over to Steve Talbot, who's the filmmaker. One of his very earliest films was DC3, and he's digitized that film for us uh, for this occasion. And uh, Steve, please uh, show us the film and say a few words about what we're going to be watching. Great, thanks very much, David. And it's a pleasure to be part of this with all of you. Uh, thanks for those poems. Um, Jan, I remember you. We never have met personally, but I remember you from, from Dewey Canyon 3, filming it. Um, and Carlotta, Ron Dellums was my congressman for years. Very proud to have him as uh, my representative. Anyway, I was 22 uh, when I made this film. Uh, it was the second film I'd made with friends. The first one David had mentioned was on the March on Washington in 69. And as David mentioned, I'm now gone back to that to make a follow-up film, The Movement and the Madman. But DC3, um, I'll never forget the film, um, nor the actual experience of being there. I've been to many, many demonstrations of all kinds. And I must say, 50 years later, the demonstration of those veterans is still the most moving and dramatic demonstration that I ever personally experienced. Um, the whole week we filmed, um, and then there was a medal ceremony, as you'll see in this clip. I just remember filming that medal ceremony in, on the steps of the Capitol and chills running down my spine. Um, I was totally stunned by the spectacle of a, a thousand veterans uh, stepping to the microphone and speaking their truth and throwing their medals and citations away. It was uh, something I'll never, never forget. And it had a profound impact on the country. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I had the chance to uh, make this very scrappy amateurish film, uh, which you'll now see some of, the, some of the camp on the mall, the demonstration in front of the Supreme Court that Jan uh, referenced, and then of course that, that medal ceremony.
I'm from upstate New York, and I'd like to turn in my Bronze Star and two Purple Hearts. I lost my leg in Vietnam, and I'm totally opposed to this war we're carrying on over there. And Senator Buckley and Congressman James Hanley will receive my medals next week in the mail. Thank you. Rusty Sachs of the Captain of the Marine Corps. For Captain Roger P. Harrell of the United States Marine Corps, the Distinguished Flying Cross. For Major Robert Kramer, United States Marine Corps, who also died needlessly, the Silver Star. And everything else. <laughs> I got a good conduct medal and got out of the Army in E1, and that's how absurd it is. Army commendation. <laughs> Brian Finkel, I'm from Greeley, Colorado. National Defense Service Medal, Vietnam Service Medal, Vietnam Campaign Medal, Army Combination Medal, Bronze Star. Rod Pinwell from Xenia, Ohio. I had to turn in my Vietnam Service ribbons. One Bronze Star for heroism, which was really asinine. <laughs> Ex-Marine Sergeant, two presidential unit citations, one for, one for the murder of Johnson, one for Tricky Dick, another murder, and the rest of the crap. Dennis Kaler, ex-Army Intelligence Captain from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Ron Stars and a few others. My name is Ben Anthony from Danville, Illinois, and I'm with the Colorado delegation. Uh, Purple Heart and all this other good bullshit they give you, you know. Yeah. Here's the campaign medals, the disservice to our country, and the commendation medal for racism. I've got a gold star mother here that stayed at my house. They wouldn't let her throw the flag in, but she wants to get rid of her medals. Star the Purple Heart, the ARCOM, the CIB, and on the right, mail it in to the president and ask him why you never heard about the 800 people who died in Play Trap Valley in March of 69. My name is Bruce Sinabra from New York, and I have a Vietnamese campaign ribbon, Vietnamese service ribbon, national defense ribbon, and a Purple Heart. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's with a great deal of pleasure I return the Bronze Star and several other of these pieces of garbage. Joe Hirsch from New York City. Maybe this will help to save lives. Sal Graziano, New York. I don't want your fucking war. My name is Michael Hagan from New York. This doesn't hide scars, and this doesn't hide guilt. Walt Kurtz, Tennessee, four Brian Stars. Right on. <laughs> Chuck Searcy, Athens, Georgia. I'd just like to say that we're veterans of Vietnam and we're telling the American people that the war is wrong. I want to ask you who you're going to believe, the veterans of Vietnam or Tricky Dick? My name's Bud Armstrong. My name's America. I'm sick of what they've got going and until they stop killing your brothers, they're the traitors. Stop them. Right. Mike Guard, Fort Collins, Colorado. I have here a bunch of people that just couldn't make it, and uh, they want to turn them in, too. I'd read their names off, but it would take too long. <laughs> Kenneth Tucker, Philip Meradian, Charles Weinberg, Scott Hartman, Anthony Four, Gary Mater, Tom Whip. Jim Best, Peter Kusick, Charles Tierney, Donald Edwards, Michael Heim, Rod Gelming, Alan Rutledge, 
Steve Leonard, George Cassidy. Out of these, we got four bronze stars, five purple hearts, and three presidential unit citations. I'd like to say just one thing to the people of Vietnam. God, I'm sorry. I'm also from Fort Collins, Colorado. I was a corpsman, and uh, I'm turning in everything I got, including uh, just the Army Commendation Medal. And I hope that someday I can return to Vietnam and help rebuild that country that we tore apart. Danny Morris from Peabody, Mass. The only way we're going to bring our brothers back is to end this war if they can't believe the veterans and they can't believe in anybody. Thank you so much, Steve, for that powerful footage. Thank you. Well, now we uh, turn to one of those veterans who was, we saw a little shot of, uh, Chuck Searcy. Please, Chuck. Good morning. I'm speaking to you uh, from Hanoi, Vietnam. It's a bit early here, around 2 a.m., so I'll try not to nod off in that sense. When I first uh, heard about Dewey Canyon 3 in April 1971, I was not active in the anti-war movement. I had returned to my studies at the University of Georgia after three years in the Army. One of those years was in Vietnam, 1967 and 68, uh, as an intelligence analyst at the Combined Intelligence Center in Vietnam and Saigon. During that time, working on classified reports, uh, I became convinced that the war was wrong. It was based on lies and cover-ups by the US government. American's faith in the country was shaken. When Saigon was attacked in the 1968 Tet Offensive, fighting erupted on the streets of the city and bombs and artillery shells fell from the sky. I became more convinced that the war could not be won. When I departed Saigon in June, 1968, I was angry, bitter, confused about what it meant to be an American citizen. I had one year remaining in the military. Uh, I was reassigned to Germany, and that allowed me to put my Vietnam experience into perspective. I got beyond my anger. I decided to come back to the US and join the anti-war movement somehow. As a Vietnam vet, I felt the responsibility to help Americans understand that what we were doing in Vietnam was wrong and tragic. Some said criminal. When I returned to Athens, Georgia in 1970 and re-enrolled at the university, I was low key. I agonized about the war still, but I didn't see much opportunity to do anything. When an army buddy got in touch about Dewey Canyon 3, we agreed to meet in DC that week in April, 1971. That was really my first involvement in the anti-war movement, joining with so many veterans committed to ending the war energized and inspired me. It made me determined to be more visible and active in Athens, Georgia in my opposition to the war. That week in DC, I was uncertain if I would even participate in throwing my medals against the Capitol steps. I realized it would be symbolically powerful, but I was uh, hesitant, worried that my family would be upset by my action. As I moved in the long line toward the microphone to speak, I became nervous because I was not sure what to say. Others ahead of me had made strong statements, memorable speeches, and I was worried that I would say something not attuned to the moment or not appropriate. When I asked the crowd, are you gonna believe Vietnam veterans or Tricky Dick? That was not thought out at all. It was spontaneous and not very memorable. Uh, Whatever I hurled over the fence, it was not my medals. I already had a plan to take them to the office of Georgia's junior U.S. Senator at the time, who was up for re-election, 
and tell him uh, that I was leaving the medals to remind him every day that he was one of 100 members of the Senate who could stop the war. And it was his moral responsibility to do so. So my actions at the Capitol steps for me were symbolic. I turned around and threw something, maybe it was a coin out of my pocket. Later that day, I went to the Senator's office and left the medals with a nervous staff member who assured me that she would give them to the Senator. Two weeks later, back at the University of Georgia, a small anti-war group on campus asked me to speak at a candlelight vigil in memory of those who had been who had died in the war. I agreed. Uh, my speech had an emotional impact on the crowd. When it ended, people came up to the stage and asked if we could please stay in touch and work together to end the war. Even more encouraging and unexpected were the nine Vietnam vets who emerged out of that crowd. Vets who had not met each other until that night, that moment. The next morning at a local cafe, we formed a chapter of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. My concerns about my family were confirmed. My father, a decent man, very conservative, was a World War II veteran and a POW under the Germans. He was angry and hurt by my public actions against the war. He said, uh, I was not a good American. I did not support our government. I was not a patriot. My parents told me to leave the house and not come back. For over a year, we had no contact until my father phoned me one day, asked if we could meet and have a cup of coffee. Your mother and I have been talking, he said, and we have decided that you were right and we were wrong. This war is terrible, it's got to stop. And he added quietly, we'd like for you to come back home. It was a moving and memorable moment in my life and something that many families experienced one way or another. I look back on Dewey Canyon 3 and I realized I was pretty naive in trusting that our democratic system would bring an end to the war. I truly thought that leaving my medals on my senator's desk would help. But Dewey Canyon 3 did mark a turning point in my commitment to stop the war and it clearly had a powerful impact on millions of other Americans. It was a major turning point. In an indirect and convoluted way, the system did work. Nixon left office in disgrace. President Gerald Ford refused to prop up the failed Saigon regime, which collapsed on April 30th, 1975, and the war ended. Vietnam began a long, painful recovery in which I have been fortunate to play a small role. Dewey Canyon III was a milestone in the sequence of events that ended the war. The event emboldened other actions, protests, even voter registration drives and political campaigns that led to the eventual end of a war that continues to be a mark of shame on our nation. Sadly, we have not been able to prevent the continuation of such conduct as US ground troops, plotting campaigns from the air, now including drones, and other destructive acts waged against innocent people who have done nothing to us. A major lesson that I take from Dewey Canyon 3 is this, never doubt, never quit. Let us continue to raise our voices, to be creative. Let us pursue unceasingly an end to war and violence. This world so urgently needs peace and dignity and hope. We veterans and all American citizens have a moral responsibility to respond as we did 50 years ago. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chuck. Appreciate that. Um, now we wanna introduce Carlotta Scott, but before we do that, uh, we're gonna show a video of her former boss, uh, Congressman uh, Ron Dellums, himself a veteran from the Korea War, who was among a handful of members of Congress who went out to uh, camp or sit with the veterans on the mall uh, that night when they faced the possibility of arrest. Uh, and in many ways that Carlotta will tell us about, uh, provided support for the Vietnam veterans and for uh, the effort to tell the truth about the crimes and atrocities that were being committed in Vietnam. Uh, but before Carla, Carlotta starts, 
we have about three minutes of uh, Ron Dellums giving a speech at the first conference of our Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, which took place in Washington in May of 2015. Uh, and uh, you'll see as the film clip starts, he's being introduced uh, by the great journalist uh, Juan Gonzalez from uh, Democracy Now. So let's uh, see this segment. Ron Dellums is a, a legend in this country in the progressive movement. Uh, I just want to remind you of one thing you may have forgotten. One of his first acts when he was uh, sworn in as a U.S. representative was to take a small annex room to his office in the House of uh, in the uh, in his in his office in the House of Representatives and uh, mount an ex exhibition of the atrocities committed by the United States in Vietnam as a freshman congressman. And he has continued to stand for social justice, labor rights, environmental rights. Uh, he is a true champion of our movement, Ron Dellums. But in 1967, something magical happened. This brilliant, prophetic, articulate, eloquent minister mounted the podium in 1967, Riverside Church in New York, and laid out his reason for opposing the Vietnam War. It was courageous and historic. He laid out his moral opposition. He saw it as unjust, illegal, and immoral. One of his lessons of education was a statement that was so vivid, so powerful. We are dropping bombs in North Vietnam that are exploding in the ghettos and the barrios of America. How incredibly poetic, how incredibly powerful the vision. He was saying to people, understand the relationship between the billions of dollars that are being spent to wage war and the inability to address the injustice that is taking place in the ghettos and the barrios of America. The, the issue of priorities. Very powerful. But to me, the most powerful statement that shaped my life forever was this comment. Peace is more than simply the absence of war. It is the presence of justice. Yeah. I interpreted that to mean, wow, the peace movement is the ultimate movement. Peace is the superior idea that the umbrella movement for, of all movements, the peace movement, because to come together under the banner of peace forces us to challenge all forms of injustice. Carlotta, please. Thank you so much, David, for that memorable sharing and for such a gracious introduction earlier. I'm so honored to join everyone today for this memorable occasion. Today, I stand with you in Ron's light. He is so missed, but his wisdom and his counsel will remain with all of us always. I'm certain many of you may remember that Ron came to be known as the conscience of the Congress. And it started with his first campaign. The foundation of that campaign was based on an historical analysis and a critique of US foreign and military policy during the Cold War and was a stance against the war in Vietnam. Ron's analysis was that the premise of US policy was absolutely wrong. He believed and stated often that it was an amalgam of aged anti-communism, North American arrogance and chauvinism, racism, imperialism, and militarism. 
the US willingness to support tyranny makes revolutions inevitable even today. In honoring this 50 year memory and looking at the lessons of the Vietnam veterans protest, Dewey Canyon three remains an indelible historic moment. We are so grateful to those who participated and stepped up to call for an end to the war and to proclaim their honor and their patriotism. As you've seen in Steve's film, the significance of that week in April 1971 was powerful. With those thousands of veterans coming to Washington to protest, sponsored by Vietnam veterans against the war. And uh, Jan and, and, the, and the film showed that the mall scenes where there was tension during that week of activities. Uh, with tension mounting one of those nights, several members of Congress visited the encampment on the mall. Ron was one of those members. He sat with the California delegation of the Vietnam veterans against the war. And in expressing his continuing support for his efforts, he said he'd stay there with them as long as he needed to, even if the police and military came to arrest him. And he told them, if they're gonna arrest you, they gonna bust me too. On that Friday, April 23rd, 50 years ago today, as you saw, veterans lined up to throw their medals over that barrier that had been constructed to keep them away from the Capitol. Ron joined with hundreds and threw his medals over the fence shouting, they can have them back. Ron viewed the actions by the veterans that week as one of the strongest heroic acts in US history, an act of honor, dignity, and patriotism. When Ron entered the Congress in 1971, his first legislative and policy priority was to oppose the Vietnam War. Early that year, he met with Vietnam veterans uh, in the Citizens Commission of Inquiry on US war crimes. And he worked with them to expose the, and document the true character of the war and the immoral acts that were being committed in the name of the United States. And as Juan said, he set up an exhibit in his office uh, to show and actually show his colleagues and others the actual, what was happening so terrible in Southeast Asia. He introduced a house resolution calling for a full legislative inquiry into the conduct of the war. But of course, uh, his request for a hearing was denied. So with CCI, he organized ad hoc hearings and they were called the Dellums Committee Hearing on War Crimes in Vietnam. And it took place April 26th through April 29th that week in the Cannon Caucus Building. Ron described and shared over the years that the testimony was some of the most emotional and traumatic, traumatizing testimony he had ever heard. The hearings were published in January 1972 as a 333-page book by Vintage Books, and it was entitled The Dellums Committee Hearings on War Crimes in Vietnam, an Inquiry into Command Responsibility in Southeast Asia. Ron continued during his entire tenure in Congress and beyond to advocate for an agenda for peace and social justice from every podium and at every opportunity. I'm hoping that we have some millennials and some Gen Xs and Zs, especially young folks of color joining us today uh, so they can be able to hear and then consequently share the history of this momentous week. And they can also step up and answer the call and continue the call for peace and justice. What had been done so long ago for them was done for them and generations to come. And as Ron stated and Dr. King stated, peace entails more than the absence of war. It requires an unceasing effort to eliminate militarism, racism, social and economic justice, and the denial of personal freedom and human dignity dignity and a search for constructive relevant solutions to the problems of our nation today, just as 50 years ago. So on the next Martin Luther King holiday, 
I ask all of you to consider doing a day of service and to think of Ron and Dr. King and the roles they played in, in shaping the profound analysis about the war in Vietnam and moreover, their hope and vision for what a world at peace would look like. Thanks. Thank you so much, Carla. Thank you. Um, now we'll see a few minutes of John Kerry's famous testimony. Uh, Senator Fulbright's committee uh, did invite testimony and John gave that on April 22nd. It was televised, as I mentioned, around the country. So we have about three minutes of the video of the Kerry speech. Each day to facilitate the process by which the United States washes her hands of Vietnam, someone has to give up his life so that the United States doesn't have to admit something that the entire world already knows, so that we can't say that we've made a mistake. Someone has to die so that President Nixon won't be, and these are his words, the first president to lose a war. And we are asking Americans to think about that. Because how do you ask a man to be the last man to die in Vietnam? How do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? We are here to ask, and we're here to ask vehemently, where are the leaders of our country? Where is the leadership? We're here to ask where are McNamara, Barstow, Bundy, Gilpatrick, and so many others where are they now that we, the men whom they sent off to war, have returned? These are commanders who have deserted their troops. And there is no more serious crime in the law of war. The Army says they never leave their wounded. The Marines say they never leave even their dead. These men have left all the casualties and retreated behind a pious shield of public rectitude. They've left the real stuff of their reputations bleaching behind them in the sun in this country. And finally, this administration has done us the ultimate dishonor. They have attempted to disown us and the sacrifices we made for this country. In their blindness and fear, they have tried to deny that we are veterans or that we served in Nam. We do not need their testimony. Our own scars and stumps of limbs are witness enough for others and for ourselves we wish that a merciful God could wipe away our own memories of that service as easily as this administration has wiped their memories of us. But all that they have done and all that they can do by this denial is to make more clear than ever our own determination to undertake one last mission, to search out and destroy the last vestige of this barbaric war, to pacify our own hearts to conquer the hate and fear that have driven this country these last 10 years and more, and more. And so when 30 years from now, our brothers go down the street without a leg, without an arm or a face, and small boys ask why, we will be able to say Vietnam and not mean a desert, not a filthy obscene memory, but mean instead the place where America finally turned, and where soldiers like us helped it in the turning. Thank you. Very powerful words. Well, uh, Carlotta called us to reach out to the younger generations. Unfortunately, we have uh, our next few panelists uh, from the post 9-11 generation. And uh, so we'll begin with uh, Lauren Model joining us from Leeds, England. Lauren. Thanks so much, David. Um, and thank you for inviting me to join this important commemoration and reflection. And it's a pleasure to be here with everyone today. As David mentioned in his introduction, I approach this powerful moment of protest through academic lenses, exploring endlessly interesting primary source materials from this historical moment. From as early as eighth grade, the powerful visual of veterans rejecting their medals has shaped my own scholarly journey always wanting to know more about the soldiers and veterans who challenged the very war that they were charged with fighting. Indeed, perhaps this imagery is so powerful because it upended one of the most honored traditions of American patriotism, that of the citizen soldier. 
an ideal born of the tale of colonists who temporarily took up the mantle of the soldier to defend the democratic freedoms of a new and independent America. Indeed, the Vietnam War itself was partially conceptualized as one to protect the freedoms of the South Vietnamese from communism. However, as we've heard, the realities of the war in Vietnam prompted returning veterans to bear witness to the chasm between this rhetoric and the realities of war. Importantly, the visually striking performances of guerrilla theater and the discarding of medals suggested a new duty of citizenship and a new patriotism, one which called for action until the US practiced the democratic ideals it preached. As one vet recalled, we had taken an oath to defend the government of the United States and the constitution. What do you do when the government of the United States is the enemy of the constitution? Where does your allegiance lie? Repurposing the ideal of the citizen soldier, veterans declared that while their military service may be finished, their tour of duty to defend the nation was not. In a 1968 statement of principles, VVAW declared, we believe in the freedom to speak, to think, to change our mind and to dissent. We do not believe our country should be supported right or wrong, but rather it is our democratic duty to challenge government policies where we conscientiously believe them to be wrong. We believe that this is the highest patriotism. By foregrounding their identity as soldiers, veterans activism sought to highlight that gap between the rhetorical role of the patriotic citizen soldier and the actual role that soldiers were playing in Vietnam. While civilians made many of the same criticisms of the war, the authority of veterans was much harder for the public and for policymakers to dismiss. As historian Richard Stasewitz notes, these were men who had been in the belly of the beast and who had emerged to share their knowledge. Similarly, activist William Crandall recalled that VVAW members possessed a credibility that could not be ignored or scared away. Our slogan was, what can they do? Send us to Vietnam. And nowhere was this harder to dismiss than the images of the events of Dewey Canyon Three. As we've heard, this protest was described as a limited incursion into the countries of Congress, the Supreme Court, and the Fourth Estate. By describing the protest as an incursion, VVAW depicted the American government as an adversary that needed to be confronted. In preparation for the march, the organization declared, quote, we have identified the enemy, he is us. Armed with this knowledge, we will not in this crisis shrink from the service of our country. Instead, we will continue to bring the war home. We have identified the enemy and we will engage the enemy on his battlefield, America. The visual impact of this protest was carefully considered, so news media would carry VVAW's arguments across the nation as they bore witness to the war. Barry Romo recalled this larger media strategy, noting that Americans, quote, saw the war on TV. They had to see us on TV. People's experience was not being in a rice paddy, but watching someone in a rice paddy. We had to interrupt their seeing the war on TV with seeing veterans dem demonstrating against the war on TV. After being refused entry into Arlington National Cemetery, the protesters set up camp on the National Mall. They wore fatigues and used guerrilla theater tactics to demonstrate the realities of the war to the American public. Their authority of those, as those who had been there was inescapable. In a painfully ironic exchange, a daughter of the American Revolution approached a VVAW protester and admonished him and others, arguing that their actions weren't good for the troops. I can only imagine the simultaneous disbelief and frustration that lay behind his response, asserting simply, lady, we are the troops. The Nixon administration, aware of this visual impact, tried a number of ways to remove the vets from the mall. However, these backfired. One vet recalled that the nation found itself identifying with, quote, weary, weary looking veterans who apparently had no home except that pitiful cluster of pup tents, bed rolls, and lean-tos outside the Capitol and whose own government had now raised its hand against them. As veterans discarded medals and commendations over that fence, they also rejected familiar symbols of patriotism and service. As Jan reminded us in his opening poem, veteran Jack Smith declared, we now strip ourselves of the medals of courage and heroism. We cast these away as symbols of shame, dishonor, and inhumanity. Another veteran shouted, here are my merit badges for murder from the country I betrayed by enlisting in the US Army. These powerful visuals and statements commanded the nation's attention in a way that civilian protest had never done. 
And much of the media coverage depicted um, VVAW activists as the embodiment of this new patriotism. The Boston Globe, for example, highlighted an irony that the reenactments of the battles of Lexington and Concord in Boston occurred simultaneously with the protests in Washington. The paper wrote, those who see the young veterans attempting to buy back on the Washington Mall as an unruly bunch of subversives should recall that in 1775, colonial forces were also unruly and young. In making this direct comparison, the Globe encouraged its readers to draw a direct connection between the patriots of the past and the veteran protesters, while also putting American policymakers in the same position as tyrannical British authorities. The Washington Post following the action declared that VVAW, um, VVAW's activism in Washington demonstrated that significant numbers of Americans, quote, still believe it is important and possible to make the country practice what it professes to believe. Beyond print media, CBS and Walter Cronkite carried the message of veterans to the nation, putting his authority as a trusted news source behind the veterans, describing the protest as a new dimension in the peace movement that demanded the attention of all Americans. Through the powerful imagery of the nation's citizen soldiers, media coverage forced the American public to consider if patriotism should be defined by the dutiful obedience to the nation or by the defense of American democratic ideals. The lessons from Dewey Canyon Three echo in present day movements for social justice. The imagery of familiar symbols of patriotism and the narrative of citizens fighting tyranny, which takes away rights, is incredibly powerful. Movements such as Black Lives Matter, No DAPL, and the struggles to protect the rights of LGBTQ Americans uh, all root their arguments in the chasm between American rhetoric and reality. Indeed, veterans themselves have marched alongside civilian activists in these present day protests, with some suggesting that this was an extension of their service to the nation. They call on a powerful tradition of citizens temporarily putting aside their daily lives to stand up against a tyrannical force that does not protect those rights. By leveraging the visual impact of their arguments, they too are positing a new patriotic identity that places protest at the center of American patriotism and places the defense of these ideals as the primary duty of the citizen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lauren's one of a number of younger scholars who are studying the GI and veterans and anti-war movements uh, for the future. Uh, next, we turn to our colleagues from Veterans for Peace, uh, beginning with Adrienne Kinney. Thank you. Um, I've really appreciated um, being able to participate in this in this program as a as a Gen Xer and post 9-11 veteran. Um, it's been very interesting listening to and, and hearing some of the videos. And of course, throughout my experience in the veteran anti-war movement, I've learned a lot from uh, those GI resistors who came before me. Um, one thing I've been really contemplating as I've, I've listened to and, and prepared for this um, talk was the idea of medals as propaganda and control in that um, medals are really a way to write history and legitimize acts of war that are largely designed to oppress and control others. It's, it's one way of trying to codify um, acts of war as righteous, um, largely by white men and largely medals are given to fellow white men. Um, and this includes, unfortunately, 20 medals of honor that were awarded to soldiers who per, uh, participated in the massacre at Wounded Knee. Um, as many of you probably know, there is an act to remove the stain that would be designed to rescind the, the medals that were awarded to those who participated in that genocidal act. Um, there are also medals that were awarded to those who participated in the dropping the atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And to my knowledge, there has not been a movement to rescind those medals. Um, and in fact, the history of the bombings of Japan has largely been washed out um, through the, through the um, intentional uh, erasure of those generals and soldiers who refused to participate in dropping bombs on civilian populations, saying that it had nothing to do with ending the war, um, but yet the, the attacks on Nagasaki and Hiroshima are today taught as, as acts that helped save the lives of American service members. Um, 
I, throughout my, um, my experience, I have seen Vietnam veterans who have stood up and said they've seen through that propaganda. And they said that they, they have said that they no longer want to have anything to do with that. And they um, intentionally made a, a stand in Washington, D.C. on that day, saying that the medals that they received could not undo the war crimes that they participated in. Um, as somebody who um, did grow up in a very unique time period, I've been thinking about this quite a bit, um, the 80s. It was a time where I was had the fortune to grow up before, before the internet really took off. So my childhood was really rooted in that tradition of just being a kid who is out riding a bike and exploring life and an adult who is now living in this online world and how all of that changes the way we interact as people. One of those ways is that we're having this webinar and are able to remember and make note of this um, moment in time uh, through the power of the internet. Um, but I also think, you know, I mean, as somebody who loves history and who loves um, reflecting on acts of history, um, I recently heard the quote, um, and to paraphrase, um, that I do not inherit the earth from the generations that came before me. I am borrowing it from the generations that come after me. And I think a lot about what that means um, because, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, it's not saying for me, it's not saying that history is irrelevant, but yet we have to take those acts of history and interpret them um, in a way that allows us to continue to learn. And so one of the things I've done a lot over the past um, years, we've all been thinking about things differently during lockdown, is um, what have I learned um, during my um, participation in the veteran anti-war movement? And I would say that one of the biggest things is the importance of the voice of veterans and the voices of those who have participated in war. But um, as we shift, you know, war, it used to be um, more so fought by people on ground and then in the air, but um, particularly as technology changes and drone warfare um, is becoming more prevalent. I think about this a lot because the numbers of soldiers needed to wage war now is less than it used to be. And so I think about that because I think it's impressed to acknowledge the role that um, soldiers play in, in standing up against war and militarism. But I also think it's important for us to not say that those voices mean more than every other citizen who shares this planet with us. Um, every other person, every other being, um, every other, you know, Adam that shares this earth with us. Uh, because regardless of whether or not somebody has served in a military, um, all of our uh, rights and thoughts and opinions matter. And our morality and ethics, I think it depends on us always being open to learning and moving forward. And you know, it was interesting when I first joined IVAW, there were so many members who wanted to do everything just as Vietnam veterans against the war had done them. You know, we wanted to recreate Winter Soldier. We wanted to recreate Dewey Canyon. Um, and although that is, um, I think, you know, as somebody who participated in organizing Winter Soldier um, and participated as a testifier, I think it's important to honor um, and acknowledge the acts of those and, and try to figure out how they fit in our own lives. But I also think there needs to be um, room to grow and learn and think about things differently. And I don't know, there's there's so many different things I've, I've thought about. I really appreciate um, the time and the panel and I really appreciate, um, hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A afterwards as well. So thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Uh, Garrett, please. Thank you, David. Um, 
Yeah, it's an honor to be part of this panel. Um, I wanted to start by by reading some of the language of the uh, box 21 on my Army Commendation Medal that I received after Iraq. It says, extraordinary service during ground combat operations against enemy forces in Task Force Lion Sector from February 04 to February 05. Specialist Reppenhagen displayed ex uh, exceptional professionalism against enemy forces while serving as a member of Task Force Sniper Team. Specialist Reppenhagen dedicated uh, to his fellow soldiers on the battlefield upholds the finest traditions of military service and reflects great credit upon himself, the Lion Battalion, the Iron Brigade in the United States Army. <laughs> That's the kind of flowery language that is uh, typically in uh, these sorts of medals. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, uh, even at the time I remember being an, awarded an Army Commendation Medal, which, which honestly is the, is, is the lowest level of medal that you can receive uh, after, you know, being in, in a war campaign. Um, with the U.S. Army. Each branch has a similar uh, accommodation medal. Um, while I watched myself get this medal, um, the achievements upon my paperwork uh, explain the fact that I participated in over 180 sniper missions without the use of a armored vehicle. Uh, the fact that I, uh, uh, you know, distinguished myself in, in multiple combat engagements, including, uh, you know, during an attack, an RPG attack, on the rooftop of a police station uh, in Hib Hib, Iraq, where I plotted mortar, uh, mortar and indirect fire uh, and destroyed the enemy. Um, uh, even, uh, even training uh, other snipers uh, in my brigade um, are all listed here as, as these things that, uh, you know, show witness of, of being involved in a lot of combat, a lot of uh, military engagement. Um, and I watched as officers in my, in my own battalion uh, receive higher level awards um, just because they were officers and because they were deployed at the same time, uh, but rarely had any sort of, in, in some cases, no military, like actual combat engagements. And uh, reflecting upon this, uh, I was interested in, you know, uh, the divisions of, you know, military awards. And uh, one of the things that I came up with was in 1976, uh, there's a uh, uh, academic article called the Medal of Honor, Combat Orientations and Latent Role Structure in the United States Military. It's by uh, Joseph A. Blank and uh, Solon Butler. And what they found out, spe uh, specifically this is with the Medal of Honor, that uh, over 50% of medals of honors giving to enlisted soldiers were for um, soldier saving acts, many of them called grenade incidents, which um, you can imagine is, is uh, sacrificing yourself on top of a grenade to save your friends, life, life ending uh, almost always. And uh, f over 50% of the officers uh, received their medal of honors for war winning quote unquote, war winning um, leadership roles and mission directives. Um, so it's, it's just curious, you know, just looking in, in investigating what these medals are and, and how they're given. In the entire global war on terror, which is the longest running war campaign in uh, American history, uh, US American history, um, only 19 medals of honor have been awarded in the entire time from the beginning in 2001 uh, to today. And uh, in reflection, Vietnam, there were 261 during the Vietnam War, 146 in the Korean War, 473 in World War II, and 132 in World War I, and 1,523 in the Civil War, and then 965 in campaigns conflicts during peacetime, um, which is strange that uh, campaign and conflict um, is considered peacetime when it's a paradox it is not um, so it's just curious is is war today you know is war today different um, is it less heroic is it um, you know are there less opportunities in the way that we wage war uh, using drones and cruise missiles and airstrikes and special forces and contractors um, you know uh, is it so unilateral in the way that we fight war uh, that uh, those 
those opportunities of heroism perhaps uh is 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 less less uh opportunistic i don't know but uh you know it it begs the question you know why do we get these awards you know some could say that it's for togetherness you know it it builds uh it builds support not only amongst service members uh but amongst our nation to support war uh to promote war glorification to promote hero worship um you know it's uh you know it's it seems like it's it's this binding thing that not only does that individual service member receive an award but it it's it's almost like our entire nation shares it like a like an American Olympiad that wins a gold medal, um, we all seem to share that award. Uh, you know, we won a gold medal. We won a Purple Heart. We won all these accommodations. We won, you know, uh, silver stars and bronze stars. And uh, it just perpetuates this this uh, glorification of war. Just to, just as we do every Veterans Day or Memorial Day, it's just another thing to to push forward this war culture. So. You know, I think there's another thing about it, uh, these awards, which is division. When you look at your unit and I receive an ARCOM and my officer receives a bronze star, those equal points on a promotion board and accelerates a, a service member's career into eventually possibly becoming a general. Well, what good does it do me as an enlisted soldier that's probably one foot out the door, um, very expendable, most likely, um, you know, do, why would I need a bronze star? You know, does it, does it serve me? I, I, I am not a pathway to become a general. Um, so there's divisions. And then we look at ourselves in the military uh, and we compare our traumas and we pick, compare our, our sacrifices. Um, we can, comp we can compare how, you know, how much combat we witnessed or, or competed against in. And uh, it's just another way to separate us. And, uh, you know, I find that disgusting as a, as a veteran and being, you know, being part of a veterans movement, we're trying to build solidarity. Um, you know, it only divides us, you know, were you, were you a combat service, you know, soldier, were you a Marine um, or were you stateside and does it even matter? Um, I don't think it does. Uh, so when we look at the credibility of veterans protesting versus civilians, you know, that creates another division. Um, but you know, when we reject these medals, you know, I know, I know David wanted me to mention the fact that, you know, Iraq Veterans Against the War um, took a lot of our mentorship and guidance from, uh, you know, our, our Vietnam veterans, the Vietnam Veterans Against the War and uh, Veterans for Peace members. And we duplicated the Winter Soldier Trials. We duplicated a lot of, uh, you know, the, the outstanding legacy. And we also duplicated uh, returning our medals. And, uh, and and we we want to do it in a unique way to not just reject American militarism, but reject uh, international militarism. Uh, so we took the, the opportunity during the NATO summit in Chicago in 2012 uh, to return our medals um, to, to the NATO summit um, in a rejection and, and a recognition that um, these war efforts now are international. And, uh, you know, it's when we return the medals, you know, we're, we're rejecting this, you know, this glorification of war, these divisions that, that it creates in this war culture and this nationalism. And that's the thing, right? When I read articles uh, and, and I heard about people who uh, disagreed with our returning these medals, a lot of times uh, something that was brought up is that they're heirlooms to be passed on to your, you know, your kids and grandkids. And uh, it just sickens me that, that that glorification of war is wanted to be passed on to our kids and grandkids. It's almost to, to encourage uh, generations past me uh, to, to do as I did, serve in war, commit atrocities overseas, perpetuate violence on other people, and uh, possibly even be sacrificed for, for these you know, fraudulent causes. Um, and uh, you know, it, it has to end. And, uh, you know, that's why we rejected it. And that's why we threw our medals back. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a protest against war, but it's a protest against this national, nationalistic identity that promotes war. And uh, that, that connects to that justice um, that we talked about earlier. That connects to why there's intersectionalities between war and racism 
and income inequality. And uh, that's why, you know, we, we bring it back to why our, our barrios and our ghettos and, and now, you know, deeper parts of, of our American society are, are struggling and need help. And we don't need a larger budget, military budget. We need, we need support for our communities. And these medals do nothing for us uh, in that regard. So we reject them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Garrett and everyone. Wonderful comments from all of you. So we have some time for uh, questions. Uh, several have come in um, from folks who registered and have been on, also come in on the chat. Um, so maybe just to follow up where Garrett kind of left off, uh, a couple of questions were around this issue of uh, how do we help to build the movement today uh, and reach out to veterans and soldiers as part of that movement uh, against these continuing wars, the forever war uh, that's been mentioned several times and uh, the continuing high levels of military budget. The new administration has proposed a military budget that's even greater than the already bloated level up to $750 billion. Uh, how can we as a peace movement or broader social justice movement and especially veterans and soldiers uh, play a role in helping to, to build that movement? Um, I'll uh, maybe ask uh, Adrian maybe to start us off and maybe uh, ask Chuck or Jan to jump in as well. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. And actually that reminds me of something that I hope to bring up um, and that's the idea that um, when I when I worked in the VA, there were a lot of um, uh, older co-workers who had protested as civilians who were in Vietnam, and a lot of them uh, felt bad for their participation in those protests because they, over time, have been uh, their their participation in protests against war has been rewritten as pro protest against the soldier, and. You know, I remember them saying to me, you know, I'm really glad that you're standing up against the war because really it's important for veterans to do so and people who have actually served in the military. And I guess that's something I think that veterans of wars really need to actively um, say is not right, that everybody has the right to protest, that protest is not equal, saying that soldiers are bad, it, it is saying that war and and nationalism and oppression and everything that goes with it um, is bad and needs to be corrected, that our priorities as a country need to be corrected. Um, and so much of it goes to education as well. But when people hear about the bloated Pentagon budget and the money that goes to the Department of Defense, uh, they think it's there to help soldiers and to help save soldiers and to help keep them protected during times of of war and the reality is it goes to contractors and people who are making billions of dollars in profit off the back of war. So I think it's it's just so important to not only speak uh, truth to power, but to say that everybody's voice matters. Thank you. Other panelists wanna jump in on that one? Um, jump in here. Um, it should be noted that at the beginning of the year, the doomsday clock has been moved to five seconds before midnight. We're speaking of the potential of nuclear war. Um, also, the uh, Vietnam veterans, you know, World War I, World War II, Korean War, when soldiers came home from those wars, they were told they were shell-shocked. It was only in Vietnam that they began to identify uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And unlike the veterans who served in Iraq and unlike the veterans who served in Afghanistan, uh, Vietnam veterans, we were not debriefed. We were not told you are going to have nightmares. You are gonna have uncontrollable rage. Um, you're gonna have survival guilt. None of this was told to us. We just came home and one day our lives began to burn down. 285 Vietnam veterans die every day. Um, two two hundred thousand of us have um, committed suicide. So America just people just need to understand how terrible it is to go to war. 
And if you come back from war um, diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, there's the trauma of the veteran. The veteran in turn traumatizes their spouse and then they in turn traumatize their children. So there's a heavy, right, heavy price to pay. And um, I commend those veterans who, who threw those medals back. Um, but when you come home from war, you, um, you uh, have this adrenaline, you, you are addicted to adrenaline rushes. So a number of us went to um, Nicaragua, a number of Vietnam veterans went to Nicaragua to stand in solidarity to the, with the Sandinistas because we didn't want Nicaragua to become the, the next Vietnam. So again, we put ourselves in harm, harm's way to stand for a moral position. And I was one of those people. Yeah, and some of our, our veterans today have been standing in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and Black Rock and, and other protests for social justice uh, here in America. And Carlotta, please. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to follow up on um, what um, Lamont and Garrett had said. And Adrian, one of the things that, and to answer the question, toward to try to answer the question, is to note that coalition politics works. And just as you mentioned Black Lives Matter, and just as Lamont uh, mentioned um, the silent war against Nicaragua, is that those people and organizations who have identified specific issues for which they're advocating can join others and continue to ad advocate for their issues as well as acknowledge what's happening on a daily basis vis-a-vis -vis veterans and, and the ongoing wars that we continue to be a part of. And, you know, Ron laid out, you know, I don't, I don't know if anyone remembers, uh, but each year, <clears throat> the uh, Congressional Black Caucus introduced an alternative military budget, a budget and an alternative military budget. And it was a budget that allocated the military dollars to address what was ailing our nation. We had lousy schools, we had awful housing, we had no transportation, the whole, the list is infinite. And once we could get people to understand that as we are talking about uh, addressing military and foreign policy issues, they are directly interconnected to what's happening domestically. And uh, I know that um, um, Chuck and Steve have, have referenced Ron's book often in terms of looking at alternatives and ways to address the needs of what it is we need in the nation today. So coalition politics work. And that's how one, he got the Congress. That's how two, we got as far as we did inside the Congress working across the aisle to make sure that we could address is issues. And one of the key issues that showed where coalition worked was in uh, getting rid of the sanctions uh, for, uh, against South Africa. We're about at the end of our time here. Any, uh, any other comments from any of the panelists? I'll offer some, including Steve. Yeah. Just very quickly, Lamont mentioned the, um, the doomsday clock and nuclear weapons. And um, in the film that I'm working on now, uh, we're looking at Nixon's very real plans to um, use tactical nuclear weapons uh, against North Vietnam uh, back in 1969. And that wasn't the only case. Uh, Westmoreland wanted to use them uh, seriously considered around the Battle of Quezon much earlier. And Nixon never totally gave up the idea of using nuclear weapons in Vietnam. And that's one thing that I gotta say, the anti-war movement, the veterans movement, the anti-war movement in general, um, did 
they've kept the lid on the absolute extreme violence of, uh, of using, as awful as the war was in Vietnam, nuclear weapons, thank God, weren't used. And the movement um, played a major role in making sure that happened, did not happen. Great. Well, again, thank you all so much for your presentations, uh, really moving comments and powerful message that we're delivering here. And uh, Ron Dellums talked about peace as the, the ultimate kind of movement embracing these coalitions, the intersectionality of social injustice and violence. So we all have a lot of work yet to do, but hopefully we can continue to work together across generations. Uh, on a, multiple issues uh, to work for peace with justice. So thank you all and thank you all for listening, all the participants online and uh, have a good afternoon.